Good morning and welcome to our program, Peace, Valor, and Victory, Finding and Remembering North Carolina Veterans with Fold 3. I am Francesca Perez Evans, the Community Engagement Librarian with the State Library of North Carolina's Government and Heritage Library. I will be your host and moderator for today's event. Please visit the State Library of North Carolina's website to learn more about the library's collections and services. You will also find a link to our website in the chat box. Once the presentation has ended, we will send you a follow-up email with a list of resources mentioned in today's program. This presentation will also be recorded and made available online. Live captioning will be available for this presentation. To view closed captioning in this platform, please use your mouse to hover over the control bar on the top or bottom of the screen and click on the closed caption button. Second, select either show subtitle or view full transcript to see captions during the presentation. To make any changes to the captioning settings, click on the closed caption button and select the subtitle settings option. A settings box will appear. Click on the accessibility button and make any changes as you see fit. Finally, on the same toolbar, click on the chat button to bring up the chat box. Please send a message to our team if you need technical help or would like to add any questions for the presenters to answer at the end of the presentation. Next, we also ask everyone to please keep their sound on mute. Without further ado, please let me introduce our speakers. Erin Bradford is a reference librarian at the SLNC Government and Heritage Library. She enjoys helping people with North Carolina history and genealogy research. Erin has 30 plus years experience in genealogy and a background in history, focusing on North Carolina, African American history and public history. She received her master's in library science from North Carolina Central University. She looks forward to meeting you and helping you reach your excuse me, and helping you in your research journey. Taylor Thompson is a reference services assistant at the State Library of North Carolina's Government and Heritage Library. She holds a bachelor's degree in history from Roanoke College and is currently working towards her master's in library and information science from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Her research interests include women's history, U.S. history, and early 20th century history. She enjoys learning about the rich heritage of North Carolina and hopes to inspire others to make new discoveries in their research. To get us started with our Peace, Valor, and Victory presentation, please welcome Erin Bradford. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is not moving forward. Um, oh, there we go. There we go. Thank you. So I want to talk to, I want to, I want to say we are excited to dive into fall three with y'all today. I want to talk about the title a bit. It is inspired by three classic Greek sculpt three classic Greek figures that are depicted on the tomb of the unknown soldier, which represents peace, valor, and victory. And uh, the tomb was erected a hundred years ago today. And fall three is an innovative tool that puts spots, spaces, and places and names on 
soldiers who have served for our country. So let's talk about what Fall Tree is. Fall Tree was formerly known as Footnotes.com. It is named for the third ceremonial fold of the flag folding, third fold of the flag folding ceremony. And the third fold represents honor and remembrance to those who served. It is an online database that focused primarily on, on military research, but it does have other things as well, and has records, photos, and stories of those who served, of the veterans. So today for our screenshot and also for the demo we will have later, all come from Fold Tree Library Edition. Many libraries offer access to that, including us. And if you're a North Carolina resident, you can apply for a library card with us. The URL is on the screen right now. And um, if you're not a North Carolina resident, I'm sorry we can't give you a library card, but to be sure, I would encourage you to contact your local and state library to see if they can help with that. So while I was doing research for this presentation, I noticed the same records occurring over and over again. And so that's what I would like to talk about right now, which is what I call common records. So I'm starting off with the service and draft records. These appear, these are unrelated different records, but they're kind of related. So service records are concerned with the service, but it can include enlistment information. And the information can vary very widely over time. Uh, we had there are service records on Ford three from the Revolutionary War to the Spanish-American War to the last war of the 1800s. And then there are draft cards for World War One and World War Two, and hopefully with time they will add more on for more recent wars. And um, I do want to note that for the service records, some of the records are what are considered indexes that Fold Three uses. The original record would be with the National Archives, and you could contact the National Archives to get copies of the records. There are some original records, which is for the Revolutionary War and the Civil War. And so let's take a look at some examples. So first, on the left-hand side, these are from indexes that I mentioned. For from left to right, the Mexican-American War, the Spanish War, and the War of 1812. And then on the right-hand side, or for the Revolutionary War, these are the actual records here. There's only two pages for the Revolutionary War. Civil War records can span dozens of pages, so very detailed information, whereas Revolutionary War basically gives just the name and the unit that they served in. Um, on contrast, here is the draft record. <laughs> like it gets to come. There we go. So this is a draft record of my grandfather for World War II. And you can, just to give you an idea of the type of information you can find in a draft record would include the name, the occupation, where they lived. But the draft records were created from the Selective Service Act. So having a draft card doesn't necessarily mean they fought. It just, it just there, the idea was that they could be called on for service at a later time if it was needed. So because of that, it also includes someone who would always know where you live, like a permanent address type of thing. And in this case, it's his father, and it gives information about how to contact his father in case they need to get a hold of Fred. Okay, so now they're 
common records are pension records. Uh, pensions exist on poll three for War of 1812, the Indian Wars, which for North Carolina specifically, the Cherokee removal. And I forgot to mention they do have Cherokee removal service records as well for those who participated in removing the Cherokee tribe to Oklahoma. Um, I also had pensions for the Civil War, but only for the Union. And for the Spanish-American War and so on, the, on the image is a winner's pension for Hardy Middleton, who served in the U.S. Colored Troops from North Carolina. And next thing I want to talk about is down to them, but land is very important in genealogy and historic, historical research. And land helps put, name, put a place to where people lived. And for the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812, Bouncy Land was offered as a way to entice people to enlist and also as a reward for service. The amount of land that was given is dependent on the rank and the length of service. The Revolutionary War was only for the Continental Army only, not for the state and for not for the state militia. And land was granted in what is the Northwest Territory, which is now Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Minnesota, Ohio, and Wisconsin. If someone received land in what is Tennessee, they're not going to be on floor three. That would be in the State Archives of North Carolina. For the War of 1812, land is granted in Arkansas, Illinois, and Michigan. And there's an Im the image is from a, a draft of those. The, the records are mostly, not a draft, I'm sorry. <laughs> the records are mostly in-depth on fold three, but the original records would be in the National Archives again. Photos are highly sought after. Everybody's looking for photos. They want to see what the ancestors look like. So here's a collage of photos that I created from different photo collections on fold three. Photos existed in the United States from about the 1840s on. And the first war to have a photograph collection was the Civil War. And the Brady Photograph Collection, probably the most famous military photo collection there is, and that is also on Fold 3. I'm not including that because they kind of tend to be a little bit gory. So, <laughs> um, but from the top left is a Vietnam soldier visiting a doctor. And on the bottom left is a World War II bomber. And just out of that is an image from a World War II yearbook. They have a lot of yearbooks on the site, spanning many, many wars uh, up through current times. Then just out of that is from the National World War I Museum Portrait Collection. And then on the far right is from the Horner Military Academy in Oxford, North Carolina during World War I. And talking about, I want to kind of change gears and talk about search strategies. There's a lot of great collections on Ford 3, but what is the best way to browse? And I think partially that depends on if you want to browse for like for a whole place or for a person versus if you're doing a search for a very specific record. So I'm gonna start with doing a browse for anything that has to do with Greensboro, North Carolina. And when you're doing a search, whether it's for a person or for a place, it's really important that you click on name or place instead of just hitting enter and doing a search. Because if you do that, it becomes a keyword search. And the keyword search, they will search for all the terms that are listed, but not necessarily the exact term you put in. So for example, Greensboro, North Carolina could end up becoming Greensboro, Vermont. 
for a widow's pension for a woman named Carolina that happened to live on North Street. For example, if you do a name search for John Smith, they might come up with John Smith Andrews, for example. One caveat about the search is that even if you do a name search or a place search, if there's no results, it will become, it will become a keyword search by default. Um, so once you enter in your search terms, you, the left-hand side of the screen will have several options that you can, re, you can refine your search by filters. Uh, you can do filters by place, by branch of military, uh, by where they were stationed, the war, the conflict that they were involved in, things like that. Options, since this is a place search, the options may be a little bit different if it's a name search. And I'm just going to stop right there with the browsing because that can, um, can get very involved. <laughs> so since I'm not looking for anything specific now, I want to turn to looking for a specific record. I want to look for the War of 1812 Bounty Land record for William Carmichael, who was from North Carolina. So for that, I'm going back to the home page of fold three. And I'm going to click on War of 1812. Um, <laughs> from there, I'm going to type in as a keyword search this time, just bounty lap. And that will take us to publications that have deal with bounty land. So in this case, there's two that come up and you click on the right one that you're looking for. And then on the next step, the next two steps, it does really doesn't matter what the order is, whether you do it by place first and then add in the name for the search or if you start with the name and then filter it down by place. It doesn't really matter which order you do it. But I'm going to start with entering place. So in this case, I'm going to do North Carolina and I'll make sure I'm going to click on place to do a place search. And then now in the search bar, it's going to look a little bit different, <laughs> a little bit crowded maybe. But I'm going to go ahead and enter his name, William Carmichael, and do it as a name search. And we get two results that it will look through. And um, that's just an example of how you would do a search for a specific record. And so I hope that these search strategies help give you some ideas. And I'm going to now turn this over to Tyler who will talk about some special collections and um, take us on a tour of the memorial from Fold 3. Right, thank you, Erin, and hello, everyone. Um, so I'm going to move into the part of the presentation that we like to call special collections. And in other words, um, these are collections that we think are notable. So Aaron did a great job talking about some common record groups that are available in Fold3, but I wanna let you know that there are hundreds of other collections out there that go beyond these common record types. And um, I literally could be here talking for the whole day about all of the interesting things that you can find in Fold3. Um, but for the purposes of this presentation, I'm gonna highlight a select few. Um, we're going to highlight some that we believe are significant for two reasons. One being that they contain substantial information about North Carolina veterans. And two, because they're kind of, um, these collections are unique in the sense that they're miscellaneous in nature and they um, have a lot of information that you might not expect to find on Fold 3. So let's take a look at some. Um, but first, you might be wondering where can we find that these collections that we're talking about today? Um, so I'm going to show you, this is a screenshot of the Fold3 homepage. And so to search for collections, we can do so in one of two ways. Um, if we know the name of a collection, 
we can search um, for it in uh, this search box right here, a general search box. Now we're gonna learn some of the names of the collections today so you have an idea of them. We can also, you'll notice there are collections organized by topic. So there are collections first organized by country and then they're mostly, the topics are organized by chronologically by war. So starting with the Revolutionary War and moving on through time. Now there are some other um, topics on here that are not chronologically by war. For example, you'll see an African-American collection. Um, there's a topic also on Native Americans, even non-military records. So just a really interesting um, look at some other topics out there that are available to search. So for example, we might be interested in um, what kind of collections are out there about the Korean War. So we could click on the Korean War and we'd be led to a separate page where we'll um, get an overview of the Korean War um, collection in fold three. So in here, we'll get a description of the Korean War. And if you look towards the top of the page, you'll notice um, here in the red circle, there's a top uh, a option for publications. And so we can click on that and we'll be led to all of the collections in fold three, a listing of them um, that contain information about the Korean War. So, you know, this if you're looking at this on the site, you could scroll through this and there might be a hundred different collections in there. Um, it totally depends by war on, on the topic, you know, what's been digitized, what's available on full three, but there's so many things that you can look through. So again, I'm gonna highlight um, some of the collections today. So I'm gonna kind of move chrono chronologically and highlight first some col um, special collections from pre-1900. So pre-1900, um, the majority of interesting of collections that I found that kind of fall outside of those common record types that Aaron was talking about come from the Civil War period up to the turn of the century in 1900. And three collections that um, contain a lot of information about North Carolina veterans that I'm going to highlight today are the discharge certificates and miscellaneous records of the regular army from 1792 to 1815 the War of 1812 Society Applications in the District of Columbia, and the final statements from 1862 to 1899. So let's take a look at what these are about. So the discharge certificates and miscellaneous records of the regular army from 1792 to 1815. The regular army might not be a term that all of us are familiar with. Essentially what it is, is the, um, it's the army that succeeded the Continental Army following the Revolutionary War. And the regular army is actually still a major section of the US Army today. So these, this collection of records is gonna have a variety of types of records. So for example, we'll have discharge certificates. So records that were issued when a soldier left the service. Also a variety of other things. For example, we can find payment vouchers in here sometimes, affidavits, sometimes descriptive inventories of items that were issued to a soldier. So all sorts of things that we can find. Most of the records in this group obviously are gonna be handwritten, but there are sometimes transcripts um, that have been typed of these records as well. And sometimes we'll also find really interesting information about soldiers through these documents. For example, they might give us a physical description of the soldier or just vital information about you know, where they may have been from when they were born, who they may have married, when they died. So these can be really interesting. For example, I'll show you here, this is an example of a transcript of an original document. Um, this is a discharge certificate for David Robertson. And through this record, we can find that he was born in Rutherford County, North Carolina. He was 23 years old when he left the service. And we can get an idea of what he looked like for example, he was five feet, 10 inches tall. He was um, had a fair complexion, gray eyes, dark hair, and he was by profession a hatter. So something we may not have expected to find about him in here. Also, I wanna mention that the records in this collection are really varied. They're not in, they're also just not uniform. For example, um, this image on the right here is also a discharge certificate. Um, you know, also for a North Carolina soldier, but it's kind of in a typed format and, you know, it's been handwritten in, in the blanks. Um, also on the left side, we'll see kind of similar information that we saw in that first um, picture, but it's kind of in the form of a table. So there's a lot of variety uh, that we can find in these records. 
The next collection I'll talk about is the War of 1812 Society applications in the District of Columbia. Now, essentially what these are is they are lineage society applications, and particularly for the Society of the War of 1812 and the District of Columbia, which was um, which is still a branch of the General Society of the War of 1812. So this is a lineage society. Um, and you know, something kind of rare to find, not a lot of lineage societies kind of put some of their records out here and things that they've collected um, for people to look at. So essentially these are great for connecting veterans um, to the um, War of 1812 to also descendants. So if you're doing you know, genealogy research or just even researching a soldier, these can be um, critical to look at because sometimes they'll give us information on the soldier, the War of 1812 ancestors, service history and kind of information about them. But sometimes we can also find vital information about their descendants because the applicants to the society would have had to prove their connection to all of the descendants. Now, um, the District of Columbia is in the title of this um, you know, collection, but we can still find information about North Carolina and other you know, states, um, veterans, because remember, these applications um, were just received by the branch that was in the District of Columbia. Therefore, they're not solely about soldiers just from that area, but um, they were just received at that location. And you know, sometimes these applications are really interesting. For example, the picture here on the right um, is an, a page. This is an application from 1904. Um, and it is a listing of just in additional facts that this person has gathered about them. You know, sometimes um, they will contain information about the applicant and also um, you know, might be a bibliography of sources that they um, consulted to get this information. So that can be really helpful if you're, you're trying to um, work on um, research or genealogy. Another collection from this time period is the final statements from 1862 to 1899. And so what the final statements were is they were essentially these documents that were issued when a soldier died in the service. And they're really interesting because they kind of mimic an early death certificate. Um, if you've done your North, you know, researched your North Carolina history, you know that a North Carolina didn't start keeping birth and death certificates on a statewide basis until October 1913. So this collection predates vital records in the state. Um, so they provide information about the death of the soldier. So um, they can tell us where they died, when they died, how they died, other information as well. They can give, again, a physical description of the soldier, um, maybe their age, where they were from, um, sometimes they can even list next of kin and maybe an inventory of items that they had when they died. So I'll show you an example of a final statement here. This is one for William Bacchus, who was from the state of North Carolina. Again, we get some physical description of him. We also get information on his death. For example, here, we see that he was killed in action. He was fighting Indians in Hot Springs, Texas. And we also get a date of death for him here. Um, October 28th, 1880. And just looking through, sometimes the remark section is really interesting. Here we see that he was buried where he was found. So we, um, in Hot Springs, Texas. So we have a burial location for him as well. Um, so I definitely encourage you, if you're doing research on um, veterans from pre-1913 in the state, you know, that may have died, were born, um, this is a um, look into their military records. If you know that they had military service because they can provide a lot of vital information and essentially be a substitute to a, a, a vital record. So now we'll move into post 1900 special collections. Um, post 1900, you're gonna see a lot more collections in fold three available. Um, and that is because records became kind of more standardized during this time, more detailed. Um, a variety of reasons. Hospital culture became more prevalent during the time vital records started being kept. Um, government regulation became much more of a thing. Um, so the majority of collections that we'll see uh, for this time period, again, that fall outside those categories that Aaron mentioned are gonna be from kind of the world wars, World War I and World War II. And two I'm gonna highlight today are the US hospital mission cards files from 1942 to 1954 and the World War II cadet nursing corps card files. 
So the US hospital admission card files from 1942 to 1954, these are gonna cover World War II and the Korean War, those kind of periods. And these are essentially full text indexes of hospital records of soldiers. They're gonna mostly be about those um, who were in the army, who were treated at army facilities. But again, there are, subs uh, are exceptions to that. Um, so they're not all just on those. Um, now, hospital records, though we don't see the um, you know, original documents here, still the index gives us a lot of information, also sometimes about the service of a soldier. And medical documents are not things that we commonly see digitally online. So this is a kind of a rare thing to find. Um, also the World War II Cadet Nursing Corps card files. These, this is interesting, I believe, because it's one of very few collections in Fold 3, specifically on women. And um, particularly, this collection has a lot on North Carolina women. Um, so the Cadet Nursing Corps um, was formed in, by Congress in 1943, and um, it gave scholarships from, for women from ages 17 to 35 who committed to service and studied to be a nurse. So um, and these records can be great for kind of putting a female ancestor or a woman that you're researching in a time and place, because it gives you a lot of times where they were living and just vital information about them, such as their date of birth. Um, I can also give you admission details to their, um, the time in the core when they graduated. And they kind of remind me of kind of a draft card almost, and similar information to a draft card you'd find for a male, but this is for a female. Um, and Another th interesting thing is that it includes a lot of times their signature, which I think is fun. So next we'll move into um, the part of the presentation about memorials. So um, as we can see, Fold 3 has a lot of great records and information that we can find specifically um, you know, for veterans. But I think it's great for us to think of these documents in kind of a larger context, right? They tell us a piece of the story of the person's life and also their service and the sacrifice they made for our country. Um, so Fold 3 is also kind of this collaborative space where we can honor and commemorate our veterans. And that is through the memorial feature that it has. So I'm gonna transition us here into a live demo um, about um, the memorial feature, feature in Fold 3. And, um, so one of the hidden features of Fold 3 is that it, it has these digitized memorials available in the site for us to look at that are digitized. There are two that are currently digitized. Um, the USS Arizona Memorial that's in um, Honolulu, Hawaii, and the Vietnam Veterans Memorial that is in Washington, D.C. And so um, you guys are in luck today because we're going to take a little virtual field trip um, to these sites and um, see how we can use them to commemorate veterans and also just learn more about them. So we'll go here to get to the memorials. We'll start by going to the Fold 3 homepage. And if we hover over the memorials tab, we can find the USS Arizona Memorial. So we'll start there first. And just with a few clicks of a button, we will arrive at the memorial. So here we move to the USS Arizona, kind of an overview page about the memorial. And if you're not familiar with this memorial, it's actually um, kind of this, uh, it's, a, it's built over the remains of the USS Arizona, which was a ship that was bombed during um, the attack on Pearl Harbor um, on December 7th, 1941. And it honors the 1,177 men who perished with the ship. So, um, to get to the memorial, um, we can click on the view tab here, and then we can click on explore the Arizona Memorial. And here we are at the memorial in Honolulu. So um, this is a, a, a neat kind of interface for us. Look, so, so basically digital experts have digitized every single square inch of these memorials for us to view really easily. So as you can see, we can kind of move, um, left click here and move the memorial um, in basically any, any kind of, of way that we want to. Um, now this is not, a, it's not a 360 kind of panoramic of the building that it's in, but we can see the entire wall. There's also a zoom feature here on the side where we can kind of zoom in and we can read all of the names um, very clearly on this memorial, just as if we were standing right here in front of the wall. So we can, you know, 
take some time and you know pause here and reflect and remember veteran which is one really fulfilling way that we can use this. Um, another great way we can use the source is that it's an interactive memorial. So we can use this actually to learn more about the veterans that are named in it. So for example, um, one trivia fact you may or may not know is that there were actually seven U.S. sailors from North Carolina who died aboard the USS Arizona. And so I want to show you how we can learn more about one of those North Carolina sailors. His name was W.T. Durham, and he was a sailor in the U.S. Navy. So um, I'll show you how we can find some more information on him. So if we notice on this memorial, we have um, names that are divided into kind of two sections. We have those who are in the United States Navy and also those in the, who are in the United States Marine Corps. So um, F.T. Durham was in the Navy. So we'll zoom in and we notice that um, the names are, are alphabetical. So we'll find the section for the last name D. We'll zoom in here a little more and here we see W.T. Durham listed. And as you see, as I get closer to the names in here, they actually highlight and a link pops up that I can click on. So I can click on the link for W.T. Durham. And if you notice here on the left side, we get some kind of additional information about him. For example, now we know that W.T. Durham stands for William Teasdale Durham. He was a seaman first class. Um, he was from North Carolina. And if you scroll down, we see that there's a connected memorial for him. And essentially every veteran that's listed in this memorial has a connected memorial page that we can click on. And if we click on his memorial page, we'll be brought to a separate page specifically on W.T. Durham. Um, this is a memorial page for him. So essentially what Fold3 does is it kind of takes that information that you, we can infer from the memorial and it puts it in here. And um, there's various tabs that we can look at. For example, here's the facts tab. And this kind of gives us a chronology of his life. Um, the blue kind of information you'll see is kind of um, his service information. And we also see some other information here that we may not have known from the memorial. For example, um, he was born April 25th, 1919 in Baldwin, North Carolina. If you notice over here, there's an ad tab. Um, so basically um, the, these Fold3 connected memorials are essentially a large crowdsourcing project. So people, if you have, you now you will have to have a separate account outside of, with Fold3 outside of a library edition to access this, but I could go on here and I could add more information about W.T. Durham if I was researching him. And so, you know, this additional information that we find in here has been contributed by other researchers. Um, we can go to the stories tab, and this is a this is a probably one of my favorite features of these connected memorials um, because they're kind of like a common section where um, people can add um, you know information that they find and um, all sorts of things. For example, here a user has contributed some information about um, W. T. Durham's parents. We also have some interesting information here, like unlike. Hundreds of other Arizona soldiers, Seaman Durham's remains were recovered. He's actually buried in Farrington, North Carolina. So something we may not have known from that memorial that we can find. Um, I've seen all sorts of interesting thing, comments and things in this section. For example, I've seen um, family members sometimes of veterans will come in here and be like, hey, this was my uncle. And here, um, you know, here's a memory I have of him. Or um, you know, sometimes researchers or genealogists will come in here and try to kind of interact with others who might be researching the same person. Um, even other veterans who have memories of you know, their colleagues and other veterans will mention stories sometimes in here of their service and their time. Um, and there's also a gallery tab where people can contribute pictures. So here we have a really nice colorized photo that someone has added into the site um, here we have a picture of his tombstone um, in Farrington. And, you know, sometimes people will put links to, you know, where they found information. For example, here's a link to find a grave. So, you know, if I wanted to learn more and discover more or see what else I could find, I could click on this link and um, see what else I could discover. And there's also a sources tab where people can add, um, you know, other sources. You, if you find other sources in Fold3 that you can connect to this person, you can add them there. Also a button where you can mention that you're related to the person, which is also interesting. Um, we'll also take um, a trip over to the v U.S. Vietnam Memorial. So uh, to get there, again, we'll come up to the Memorials tab and we'll click on the U.S. Vietnam Wall. And we are 
traveling across the country here to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, DC. So again, we have a little overview of the um, memorial. We can also read some more about it on that description tab. And we click on the view tab and click explore the Vietnam Wall. And here we are at the hallowed granite in Washington, DC. So um, as you, if you've been, ever been to the um, Vietnam Memorial in Washington, DC, it's a you know, huge memorial. This is much bigger than the USS Arizona Memorial. As you can see, there are 58, over 58,000 names listed in this memorial. Um, and, but have no fear, you know, we can use that Zoom tool and we can zoom in and see the names very clearly, just as if we were here um, visiting the memorial in person. Um, now, again, um, it's going to be, we can, you know, hover over the names and get some more information on these people. But with this memorial, the names aren't, aren't as easy to find as in the USS Arizona Memorial. Um, a lot of the names, they're listed um, kind of chronologically and not alphabetically. So if we're look, you know, if you do know where someone is located, you can easily find them. But if you don't, there's another way we can search for them because these monuments are um, text searchable. And this goes for the USS Arizona as well. So for example, we're, uh, let's say for example, that we're looking for information on um, a North Carolina veteran. We'll um, look for information on Ernest, T, uh, Ernest Elders. He was a North Carolina veteran who um, was mentioned on this Vietnam Memorial Wall. So we do, we can go up to that search bar and search for his name. And thankfully he's the only person with this name. Um, we can find him very easily here. Here he is, Ernest Elder. So we can, you know, zoom out and see where he's located on the wall. And again, we have that menu here on the left side where we can learn some more about him. And Again, scroll down to the bottom, we can see that connected memorial page that has, again, the facts, the stories, the gallery, and the sources that people have um, collected about him. Now, um, we, we might be doing research about North Carolina veterans and not know necessarily the name of the person that we're looking for. So again, these monuments are searchable. So we can search for other terms as well. For example, we might just be interested in researching um, veterans from a particular place. For example, Ernest Elders was from Shelby, North Carolina. So I could even go here and type in Shelby, North Carolina. And we can see what other veterans um, are listed on this, in this monument that are um, from Shelby, North Carolina. Other, we can do other kind of searches for words as well. So for example, we might be interested in what African-American soldiers are listed in here. We can do, we can search for that. We could um, be interested in what Marines are mentioned in this memorial. We could search for them. So, you know, if you're doing a particular, doing a um, research on a particular group or community, we can learn more about those groups using these memorials, which is really neat. Another um, feature I wanna mention is the US Honor Wall. Um, this is kind of a virtual memorial specific to Fold 3. And um, basically all those connected um, memorials that we, pages that we've seen throughout um, the presentation, this is um, a collab, this is a um, kind of a collaboration of all of those connected memorials pages. So we can search for them by name, we can search um, by war. We, again, we can do keyword searches. So we could search for a place, we could search for a service branch, and we can see um, all of the names that are mentioned in um, Fold 3. Now, Fold 3 encourages you to kind of go in here, um, you know, if you have information on these veterans to add it in, edit the information. This is a crowdsourcing project and it's only as good as, you know, those who contribute to it and the information that's put out there. Um, and also, if you know you see someone that's not mentioned in here, you can also create a memorial for them, and you can do so by clicking that um, create memorial page. Now, um, these memorials are great not only just for research, but they could be used for a variety of reasons. For example, educators and teachers can use these to kind of um, make history come alive for their students, and also um, they're just a, a you know it could be a fulfilling thing to do for Veterans Day just on your own. So these are um, great, great things that we can look at. Now, um, I hope you enjoyed the, the virtual tour of the memorials. And I wanna remind you that um, 
you know, this is just a taste of what's out there. There's a lot of other information. Um, so, you know, I hope this encourages you to go out there and look for other information and what other collections might be out there for you to explore. Um, I'm also going to mention that um, some honorable mentions of um, other collections that we think are um, worth mentioning. Um, we couldn't get to all of these collections today, but some other interesting ones are Project Blue Book, the UFO Investigations, um, Confidential Correspondence, the Navy Medal of Honor recipients, Missing Air Crew Reports and Submarine Patrol Reports from World War II, also some just key American documents that are digitized in Fold 3. So some other things that we can look at that I think are exciting, that are worth investigating. And I want to remind you, we're going to have, um, after the presentation, an email will be sent out. There's a lot of um, resources here at the Government and Heritage Library that um, can be um, supplemental and useful for your research on North Carolina veterans. So I um, encourage you to look for that. So there will be a lot of other sources that will um, complement your Fold 3 research. And finally, we just want to thank especially any veterans that are joining us today. We certainly thank you for your service. This presentation would not be possible without you. So thank you. And um, we hope that everyone has a wonderful Veterans Day. And thank you all for joining us. It means a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aaron and Taylor, for giving us an overview of the full three online historical collection and searchable database, as we are, as well as giving us a tour of the site. As we begin the Q&A section of our program, we encourage you to please post any questions you have for the presenters in the chat box. I was thinking, so my grandfather was a vet of the Korean and veteran, or Korean and Vietnam War, and now I want to go straight to the U.S. honor roll wall and, like, find his information or put his information in. So that was really exciting to see that there's a resource where we can, you know, recognize all of our veterans that have done so much for us. So that's a great learning process. tool and something I didn't know that was there until I started really digging into the site. It's a really valuable source to learn about the veterans and, you know, just everyday people like you and me can contribute and, you know, work on, you know, making that information more known to people, which I think is really exciting. It's very exciting. And if you would like to ask any questions, please put it in the chat. So Taylor, I had a question just speaking about like the honor wall. Um, you mentioned a library subscription to Fold3. Can you please tell us more about that? Because you said we had to have a separate account if we wanted to add additional uh, materials onto Fold3. Yes. Yes. So, um, so I'll start kind of talking about the library edition of Fold3. So um, what we mean by the library edition of Fold3 is a lot of libraries have subscriptions to Fold3 that they are able to give access to their patrons to. So for example, here at the Government Heritage Library, we have a, a library edition of Fold3 that not only um, patrons can use here on site when they visit our library, but if you have a um, a uh, government and heritage library card, you actually can access Fold3 remotely through your library card. So if you're a North Carolina resident or a state employee, I definitely encourage you to apply for that card. It's a free card and it will get you remote access to that um, resource. So the library edition, um, it does give you kind of access to Fold3, but since it is kind of a shared version of that subscription with you know other library patrons, um, you won't be able to kind of, you know, you're not having your own separate account where you could kind of add information. So if you did want to um, work on like the um, US Honor Wall that kind of, um, ex that's specific to Fold3 or work on um, adding information to those connected memorials, you would have to have a separate um, account specifically with Fold3. Um, it might be free and you might be able to make a free account with them. I'm not exactly sure, but um, the library edition will still get you access to all of those collections that we talked about and other resources. So it's definitely a useful thing to have. 
Most definitely. I, I work in the research room and we have a lot of patients that come in and when they find out that we have a subscription to Fold3 and that they can access it um, when they receive a library card and using their library card number to get on it, they're ecstatic because they do not have to be on campus to actually use that resource. That resource is an online source that is remote and people can access it, access it as you were saying, using their library card off-site. Yeah, and I will add, you know, a lot of a lot of libraries have library subscriptions to different different databases and resources. So um, even if you're outside of North Carolina, I would encourage you to check with your local library or even your state library and see if they provide access to. We have a question from our audience. Is there any way to find info on a soldier who died in Germany of Friendly fire in 1949. Good question. Um, there are a lot of different resources in Fold3, and one of them, there are um, sometimes lists of um, casual casualties for different wars and also um, the tombstones. There is a, a really great resource. One of the collections in there, I believe, is on. Um, gravestones all the way from like the 1700 military gravestones from 1700s to I think 2013 so um, that's coming to mind as well um, and there are, are also different countries have different um, records in there as well so it might be worth looking into um, seeing if Germany has any um, kind of German records in there too. Most definitely. Thank you so much. And thank you, Jay Edwards, for asking us that question. Okay, I have one more question. And if there's anyone else in the audience that has any other questions, please let us know and put it in the chat. My Revolutionary War ancestor received bounty land in Tennessee. Does that mean he served for the North Carolina State Militia? Okay, um, for bounty land was, if they received bounty land in Tennessee, then that means they served, well, no. That means they likely serve on the North Carolina continental line, but not necessarily. It's a complicated issue. Sometimes with bounty land, they didn't want to move to where they got the land, so they would sell it to somebody else who would become what's called an assignee. And so you need to do a little bit more digging to find out. We have sources here at the library to help find out if they were state militia or if they were North Carolina Continental Line. And then there were also some who served with the Continental Army and are on Fold 3. But if they weren't with the Continental Army specifically, you won't find that on Fold 3. Thanks, Erin. I never even thought of the concept of a soldier not wanting to move and basically selling their land. So I always just assumed anyone who had those land grants, you know, were a part, like it was part of their um, payment for service. So <laughs> it's really interesting. Thank you so much. There was actually some land speculators, people who would buy up tons of land from soldiers who did not want their, their bounty land that they got. I was looking through some, doing some research a few years ago, and I saw the same person who bought thousands and thousands of acres of land. And then I was curious about that, went into the Tennessee records and found that he sold it to other people who were moving in, new settlers coming into the area. So yes, a lot of people would sell land. They, sometimes their children got the land and moved out to Tennessee or to where Illinois, Indiana, 
Michigan, wherever they were got the bounty land for. Thank you. I thank you. I didn't even. I don't know why that never crossed my mind that other people would take the land or like there would be people that would go out and buy large, um, a large inventory of land. So thank you so much, Erin. So this concludes our Q&A section of the presentation. Thank you for attending our presentation, Peace, Valor, and Victory, Finding and Remembering North Carolina Veterans with Bull 3. We appreciate you taking the time to fill out our event survey and give us feedback on this program. The survey link is on the side and in, excuse me, is on this slide and in the chat box. As we adjourn, please let's give a round of applause to our speakers, Aaron and Taylor, as well as our chat support, Jen Hamp. We would also like to thank Carolina Captioning for being our live captioner today. Thanks again for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you at other events.